Good afternoon. My name is Gail Fisher, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Jay's 72nd annual Detroit Jewish Book Fair, the oldest in the nation. As a member of the Detroit Jewish Book Fair Steering Committee and a docent at our Holocaust Center for over 20 years, I feel honored to be part of this very special program. The Book Fair team would like to thank our Plat Platinum Day sponsors, Ellen and Gerald Meekin, and our bronze book sponsor, the Voice Vision Holocaust Survivor Oral History Archive for their support. The Book Fair is also proudly sponsored by the J, where you can find your Jewish Center. Our numerous patrons and corporate sponsors, along with the purchase of books, enable the Jewish Book Fair to present most authors free of charge and we thank them for their ongoing support. Additionally, please shop our online bookstore where you can find more hand-selected books at bookshop.org slash shop slash Jewish Book Fair. I would also like to thank Schuler Books, our community bookseller partner for 2023, and extend my gratitude to the entire Book Fair committee. Your dedication and efforts have made this Book Fair possible. We have a fascinating event for you today, and we want you to be part of it. You could ask questions and offer comments in the YouTube comment section below or by texting the number in the corner of your screen. Our speaker this afternoon is Jonathan Freeland, the author of The Escape Artist, The Man Who Bro Broke Out of Auschwitz to Warn the World. This very engaging and exhilarating book won the National Jewish Book Award and tells the extraordinary true story of a Slovakian Jewish teenager, Rudith Ferba, who escaped Auschwitz to inform the world about the final solution, but whose warnings basically fell on deaf ears. Jonathan Freeland is a British journalist who writes a weekly column for The Guardian. He presents BBC Radio 4's contemporary series, The Long View. Friedland also writes thrillers under the pseudonym of Sam Borg and has written a play, Jews in Their Own Words, which was performed in 2022 at the Royal Court Theatre in London. Our conversation partner is Jamie Raitt, curator and director of the Voice, Vision, Holocaust Survivor Oral History Archive at U of M Dearborn since 2000. In 2018, Jamie became a Leo lecturer for teaching courses in world military and Holocaust history. Please join me in welcoming Jonathan Freeland and Jamie Wright. Hi, Jonathan, welcome to uh, the JCC Book Fair. It's great to have you here. Um, I'm your conversation partner today, so I think maybe the best way to proceed is to have you say a few words about the book, um, you know, the process of writing it maybe, and why did you choose to write about Rudolf Ferba? Thank you, Jamie, and thanks, uh, Gail, earlier. Thanks to all of you who are here uh, tonight watching um, this presentation. It's very, very good to be with you all. Um, we're going to go back one slide there, so we'll go to that one. Um, this is the book we're talking about. That is the UK original hardback cover. I think now uh, some of you may be more familiar with this one. Uh, Gail was kind enough to mention that it is uh, the winner of the National Jewish uh, Book Award um, for biography and also a separate award for uh, the Holocaust, writing on the Holocaust. Um it's a great pleasure anyway to talk with all of you about this, to my mind, remarkable story. I, I came across it uh, a long, long time ago when I was uh, myself just 19 years old. Um, I found myself in a um, London cinema, and uh, perhaps we can see that here. Um, there we go. You can see that. Uh, I think what we're going to try and do is make that look a little cleaner let's just have a little look and see if we can make it slideshow so hold on uh while we do that uh how do we make that look a bit better um because we want to do it like a slide don't we um 
because that's a little odd like it is. Anyway, there I was in the cinema in London, uh, the Curzon Mayfair Cinema, and I was there to see an extraordinary documentary film. Uh, the film, nine and a half hours long, the film is uh, Shoah, um, which is a uh, extraordinary documentary. It was made, it came out in 1985, 1986. It means, I'll save you the mental arithmetic. If I was 19 then, it means I'm 56 now. Um, and uh, I was, there we are, I think that's better. Um, and I was there sitting in this uh, movie theater. And the film is unusual because it shows no archive of the Holocaust. Instead, uh, it shows only uh, no black and white footage. It's just uh, interviews with the people who were witness, victim, you know, survivors or, or witnesses to the Nazi murder of six million Jews. And uh, it's a to my nineteen year old self, it looked like this procession of grey and broken old men who appeared on the screen until suddenly. At some point in the film, there bursts onto the screen someone completely different who is uh, full of charisma. And there he is. You can see him on the right. Uh, he, well, his name was Rudolf Verber. You can see there a head of thick, dark hair. You can see he's wearing the tan leather coat. He's in New York City. Uh, he was speaking English, whereas everyone else in the film was speaking you know, Russian or Czech or Polish. Uh, he was hugely charismatic. He had a kind of movie star charisma. You can see there he looks a bit like Al Pacino in Scarface or something. Um, and I found myself sort of sitting up uh, when he came on the screen because he feel, felt like somebody from our modern world rather than somebody from this uh, black and white European past. He looked like someone who was from the present day. Uh, the Almost as an aside, Claude Landsman, the French filmmaker you can see there on the left, mentions that Rudolf Verber had escaped from Auschwitz. And young as I was, I knew that almost no Jew had ever escaped from Auschwitz. Uh, I mean, you, I knew that was almost van, you know, vanishingly rare. And I found myself intrigued to know more about this man who had done the impossible. As it happens, Claude Landsman, that wasn't his main interest in talking to Rudolf Verber. Rather, he was interested in speaking about um, the fact that Verber had been in Auschwitz for 22 months, the best part of two years, which made him extremely unusual. I mean, all of you watching this, I'm sure, will know that Jews uh, had a life expectancy in Auschwitz that was measured in hours, uh, sometimes months, but not years. And yet he had been there for two years. So the name Rudolf Herber stayed with me. I was intrigued by it. Um, and I never really forgot the story. And for reasons we might get on to, in recent years, I found myself going back to the story of Rudolf Herber, um, which, I, I, as I say, I think that might be, become clear. Here then is the man we're talking about when he was 19 years old. He was 19 when he escaped from Auschwitz. Shortly after that, he would uh, join the resistance in his home country of Slovakia. There he is wearing the uniform of the Slovak resistance. He's a very, you know, intense looking man who had seen, those eyes you're looking at, had seen just the most unspeakable horrors of the 20th century. Um, and so it was... Uh, uh, his story that I found myself going back to and wanting to tell. So who was he? Who Who is this ma this man? He be, was born of a single, uh, born of two parents, but brought up really in effect by a single mother. His father died when he was four in Slovakia. An usually bright man, spoke many languages very early as a boy, showed, uh, you know, precocious intelligence, was reading newspapers and so on when he was just two or three years old. He was eventually a pupil at the best school, one of the best schools in in uh, Slovakia, in the capital, Bratislava, until the day in 1938 where his teachers said, as he turned up for school in September 1938, I'm afraid there is no place for you at this school. His name then at this point was Walter Rosenberg, Walter Rosenberg. He would become Rudolf Verber later, we'll, but for today we'll talk about him as Rudy or Rudolf. There was no place left because there was no place for Jews anymore 
in the school. <laughs> Worth stressing that at this point, um, Slovakia was not uh, occupied by Nazi Germans. It was a self governing country. It was an ally of Nazi Germany, but no more. Um, yet, nevertheless, it was imposing Nuremberg style laws on its Jewish population. In fact, I found a newspaper front page that exulted in the fact that uh, there were no more severe or stricter anti-Jewish laws anywhere in Europe than in um, Slovakia. It was extremely hardline. And so therefore he was kicked out of his school and he and his mother, a single mom who had been traveling around, she was a traveling lingerie maker and saleswoman, they moved to the small provincial town of Ternova, where Walter or Rudy would hang out with the other Jewish kids who also were barred from going to school. They would just mooch around all day. They would try and teach each other what they knew. And that went on. Each, each week would bring a new anti-Jewish edict. They would be banned from traveling. They would be banned from keeping a radio. They would be banned from having sports equipment. They would be banned from owning a business. There would be a bulletin board in the village of Turnover where these edicts would be posted. Uh, and he uh, was, you know, this was the shadow cast over his whole adolescence, really, from age uh, 14 when he moved to Turnover until he was 17. And the day in, 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 in uh, 1942 arrives when he's age 17, with a deportation notice, and a letter comes through the letterbox, thuds on the doormat saying, you are to turn up at this place and at this time with no more than 25 kilograms of possessions where you will be deported from the country. And Rudy just thought, well, no, I'm not going to accept that. I'm from Slovakia. Slovakia is my native tongue. I'm not going to. I'm not going to agree to be deported. And so he began a series of escapes really the the reason why i called the book the escape artist is he's, he he was a serial escapologist he he escaped before auschwitz and indeed after it and he escaped he tried he just tried to make for the border crossing the border with hungary um he was caught he was then sent to a deportation camp in novaki in slovakia he escaped from there he was put on a train he was sent to maidanek camp he was there for to less than two weeks, 12 days. He thought the conditions there were unspeakably bad. It was a concentration camp, slave labor. And once again, he saw an opportunity to escape when they were, uh, one of the Nazi guards at Majdanek said, we are looking for 400 volunteers who will be sent for to work on open farmland elsewhere in the country in Poland. And he volunteered for that because he thought there'll be more chance of escape. He was, he was obsessed with escape. And he got up, he was put on a train. There were people in Majdanek who said, you're crazy to do this. Don't do this where you're going. And he said, well, anywhere has got to be better than this dump. And he got on a train. Uh, it was a cattle car, a cattle wagon, no food, no water. They were on that, in that crammed in there, fetid, unsanitary conditions for some 36 hours until he arrives at this place. There, the notorious entrance to auschwitz Birkenau, or Auschwitz I, the main camp. The in important point here is that Rudy was relieved to be at this place. Um, you can see there even in the pictures that there are brick buildings there, substantial buildings and structures. That was a relief to Rudy because Majdanek, the buildings were made out of wood. They were very flimsy. They, you could freeze at night in winter. The, the roads were not, there were no roads, there were just paths made of mud here, although this picture doesn't show it so well, there were paved paths and roads. And he looked at the slogan, Arbeit macht frei, work makes you free, and thought, yeah, I can make that work too, because I'm 17 years old, I'm fit and I'm strong, and I can work. And so began uh, what would be a 22 month, like I said, odyssey at this camp he was like uh, everyone else there who was in this part of the camp he was uh, there to be a slave a slave laborer and he was bounced around different parts of the camp he was involved in buna the factory that would become auschwitz three or monovitz 
he was involved in building that, lugging cement bags of cement on his back, backbreaking work, incredibly hard work, and doing it under the whip. He was involved in the gravel pits, uh, which is again where many people died under just through sheer uh, the uh, uh, severity of the har of the labor, the harshness of the labor, and the conditions. But eventually, he made his way to a place that was known as the kind of El Dorado of Auschwitz. Uh, it was a place that was where other prisoners would whisper of this place that was a kind of Aladdin's cave of silver and gold and untold wealth. And it was nicknamed Canada. And it was called Canada partly because in the central European imagination of the 30s and 40s, Canada was thought of as a place of extreme wealth. I, I say to audiences here in Britain, it's a bit like the word California might be used now, you know, a place where you might dream of living um, rather than uh, the place you actually are. This is Canada. Rudy's, you can see there just a huge pile of bags and m rolled up mattresses and uh, uh, blankets and suitcases tied up with rope. Um, Rudy's job was getting disembarking those trains um, and getting the people off the trains and getting bags off those trains. Um, you can see them there. And then uh, all around, Canada was this area that was surrounded by about six warehouses and just piles like this. You can see that one there of blankets and suitcases. There will be other piles of men's clothes, women's clothes, of children's clothes. There would be a pile of pots, a pile of pans, a pile of... Uh, or of uh, almost a sort of blockade of uh, mattresses, uh, sorry, of prams, child, children's prams. Um, this was uh, a place where, um, uh, of just infinite amounts of stuff. And Rudy's job there was to work very quickly um, to, you know, take, to grab these piles of uh, suitcases and, um, uh, and and just pile them up so that then other people would come along them, uh, open them up and sort out the contents. Later, he would speak with some embarrassment of the fact that it took him so long to work out where he was and what he was looking at. Uh, he said he only had vague suspicions. It was He'd been there almost two or three weeks before he really started realizing, putting two and two together and thinking, where has all this stuff come from? I can see men's clothes and women's clothes, but I can also see children's clothes here, and yet there are no children. Um, what explains that? I can see prams here, but there are no babies. Um, I can see children's toys here, but there are no intact families. And like he said, it took him a long time to realize um, that he was in somewhere, that, a place that, like of which had never existed before, which was a mass killing center, a place that had been constructed for the killing en masse of human beings. Uh, the reason why there was so much stuff there, he realized, is there were more people arriving in Auschwitz than there were in Auschwitz. And that's because they were being put to death as soon as they arrived. He didn't know that in his first day or first week or first two weeks. And I think that's important for what we're going to come on to talk about, that the um, mystery of Auschwitz existed even for those who were within it. They couldn't see uh, the truth of Auschwitz. He worked there for uh, a long while, uh, uh, sorting. Uh, he would discover, he would hear tell of the expensive goods that some of the people who had arrived had stashed in their bags, you know, cognac or perfume, sometimes a diamond sewn into the hem of a dress, sometimes a roll of dollar bills that might be wrapped in a condom and placed in a tube of toothpaste. These were the sort of insurance policies of the people arriving there. People thought that maybe these items could be sold or used as bribe, bribes. Instead, they were methodically gone through in Canada, which is why it developed its reputation because it was a place where there was all kinds of riches available that would then find their way into the black economy, the black market of Auschwitz. Um, we, you know, there's, there's a whole other dimension, I think, 
to the the world of Auschwitz that is perhaps not so well known, but Rudi Verber saw it up close. He'd been there a while when he was transferred to another job here. Just look at the railway tracks on, as I look at it, on the right of the image. The uh, this is he was transferred to the Alte Judenrampe, the old Jew ramp. This was the railway tracks that would come into the camp, um, bringing in transports, loads of Jews from all over Europe, from Antwerp in Belgium, from Prague in then, you know, then Czechoslovakia, from Paris in France, you know, from Munich or Berlin in Germany, from other parts of Poland, uh, from Salonika uh, in Greece, there were, you know, uh, Amsterdam in Holland, there were people, train loads coming up to, could sometimes be five times a day, they would come often at night, and Rudy was in a special group called the Roll Commando, whose job it was to get everyone off those trains the instant they arrived, not just to going through their bags later, but to get them off the train. The first people to get off were the living, then Rudy and his rest of his unit would uh, get jump on the trains and get all the bags out, the suitcases, which would be piled up in the kind of uh, in that style. Uh, and then third and last would be the dead and the dying, those people who had died on the journey. Uh, they would be um, disembarked. And then they would line up on the railway platform. It's very hard to see it in this image. It was really just a very bare platform. They would line up and um, they would be um, uh, e e organized into columns of five where they would then go through the process, which is famous to many of us, I think, uh, and well known, of selection, um, where they would be um, uh, organized in rows of five and some famously sent to the left, uh, some to the right, often a doc doctor, sometimes uh, Joseph Mengele, would just with a flick of his finger send people to the left or to the right. If you were sent to the left, you were sent to the gas chambers. If you were sent to the right, you would be sentenced to another kind of death sentence, which would be annihilation through labor. Uh, you would be worked to death. And Rudy and his fellow members of the Royal Commando would witness this four or five times a night. Uh, they would be under very powerful electric lights, so bright that one observer said it was as if it was noon, even in the middle of the night. The people coming off the train, spilling off the train, would be dazed and confused. And it was here that Rudy came to the first of, the mo of, a, of a series of crucial realizations, a kind of breakthrough. Standing on that platform, he understood that every single person who came off those trains that he witnessed, night after night, he worked there for 10 months straight. Had, every one of those people had no idea what fate awaited them. Not one of them knew what Auschwitz meant, knew what the word Auschwitz entailed. They, it was a mystery to them. And that was because they had been lied to, lied to every step of the way. Rudy saw that they had brought those pots and pans, those children's books, those um, uh, toys for their children, because they had been told and believed that they were about to start a new life in a new place in the East, as you know, the name was never stated, where they were to form new communities. And they were told this by the SS, by the Nazis, by their collaborators, every step of the way. And the uh, SS were meticulous uh, in doing this, and they did it from the moment people got off the trains, they were told often the Nazis would go through a sort of game, a pantomime, where they would say, my word, look how badly those Slovak barbarians have treated you. Well, you've arrived somewhere much better now. Now, do re re please stay, they would say, please remember to tell us your occupation. It's very important so that you can work in your trade or occupation afterwards, they would say as they bundled them onto the trucks, taking them to the gas chambers. Outside the gas chambers, as they change clothes, one of the SS men would remind them to tie their shoes together after they'd undressed. Make sure you tie your left shoe to your right shoe so that you can find the pair afterwards. 
when they went into the gas chamber, the deception continued. They were told, you know, famously that they were going to have a shower, sometimes handed a towel and a bar of soap. Uh, there were famously in crematorium number two, there were the fake shower heads in the ceiling. At every step of the way, including months earlier, they were lied to. So months earlier, they would have received letters from people who had trod the path they were now treading, people who had been taken to the gas chambers. One of the last uh, acts of their life, those Jews, was to be forced at, under duress at gunpoint on pain of death forced to write letters home saying we've now arrived in this wonderful new place we're looking forward to our new life here there's a rabbi there's a mikvah we are somewhere where there's a school we're going to you know make a better life do come and join us we look forward to having you here some of those jews realizing what was about to happen to them would smuggle in coded messages to try and warn the recipient of the letter that all was not well and they would say in the letter, you know, do send my love to our mother, a letter might say, even though the recipient of the letter knew that their mother was dead. So why are you saying our mother? Or they would say, we are fed here very well. Every day is like Yom Kippur, a message to say there is no food here. But very often those uh, coded messages did, were not understood and did not go heard did not go heeded. Rudy sat the, stood there on that railway platform and realized that deception was not just some added extra for the Nazis. It was central to the Nazi killing method. He understood that for the Nazi method, five transports arriving a day to work, it had to go smoothly. For it to go smoothly, you needed the victims to be compliant. And for that, you needed them to have no idea what awaited them. On the contrary, they had to think, that something good was going to happen and therefore it was worth uh, maintaining order. Uh, he, as he would later say, it is much easier to kill sheep than to hunt deer. It's a very chilling phrase, but what Rudy meant was he knew that for the Nazis it was much better if they could order the, their victims in rows of five in these orderly columns. Or, that way they could, they could, it's much easier to kill sheep going through an abattoir than it is, you know, trying to pick off scattered deer on a hillside, which would what would happen if everyone was frightened and ran off. The Nazis would overwhelm most of them because they would have guns and they would be able to shoot anyone who escaped. But that would slow things down. The Nazi killing method, it was a machine. It required smooth transmission mechanisms. And so they needed deception. Rudy understood that standing on that railway platform and realized that if there was to be any chance of slowing down the killing machine, he would have to uh, find a way to um, break, to tear down that veil of ignorance and to warn the remaining Jews of Europe what fate awaited them. If they knew, he believed, what fate awaited them, then he didn't think that they would mount an armed revolt or anything. They didn't have guns. They were children. They were the elderly. But he thought they might at least be able to panic. They might panic. And the chaos of, uh, of a stampede on the railway platform, that, he believed, would at the very least throw some sand in the gears of the Nazi killing machine. So he resolved there and then that somebody had to warn the Jews of Europe what fate awaited them. And with the wonderful arrogance of youth, he decided that somebody should be him. And so he set about uh, memorizing the, uh, the, the evidence that he was seeing before him. Incredibly, as he stood on that railway platform, he memorized, he set about memorizing every transport, every train that came in, the point of origin, the estimated number of, he counted the number of wagons, the estimated number of people in each wagon, and then the number of the transport, which was given, the, you'll, you'll remember that 90, 95% of all the Jews on those trains were taken off and gassed. But five or 10% were taken off and used as slave labor. Those people were given numbers that corresponded to the train, the transport they'd been on, the number that famously would be on their uniform and then tattooed on their arms. 
That number corresponded to the transport. Rudy memorized it all. I did toy with calling this book The Memory Man um, because Rudy's feat of memory was extraordinary. He memorized the details, dates, point of origin, estimated number of victims of every transport he witnessed, which was about 300. Um, it was an astonishing feat of memory. Uh, that was his res resolve. He thought he had to um, somehow uh, warn the Jews of Europe. So he'd always wanted to escape, but now he had a reason to do it, an urgent reason to do it, which was to warn the Jews of Europe. And very particularly, by the time 1943 was heading into 1944, he became particularly set on warning the, the Jews of Hungary. He'd heard rumor in the camp that the next uh, con community of Jews to uh, fall into the Nazi inferno was going to be the Jews of Hungary. So far, they had been untouched. And uh, he then determined that he had to get out and get out quickly. Um, I'm not going to tell you exactly how he did it. Um, I'm, but that's mainly because I want you to read the book, also because time is short. Just take it from me as somebody like a lot of men in my generation. I've read a lot of escape stories of the Second World War. Um, this one is, to my mind, the most uh, uh, thrilling. Uh, it's because it's the most daring. It's the hardest escape anybody could ever attempt. When Rudy uh, planned his escape, no Jew, uh, as far as he knew, had ever successfully escaped Auschwitz. Uh, on the day he plans his escape, no Jew had ever uh, escaped Auschwitz without the help of an SS man taking them out or helping on the inside. Uh, this was his, um, uh, uh, the odds he was up against. But together with a friend from Turnover, from his hometown of Slovakia, Fred Wetzler, the two of them began to plot an escape. I won't tell you how they did it. I'll just tell you that this, that it required tremendous ingenuity, another one of those brilliant penetrating insights he realized there was a gap in the Nazi defenses, not a literal gap, not a physical gap. There wasn't a hole in the fence, but rather that there was a weakness, a kind of loophole, um, particularly involving using one of the SS or the Nazis' uh, strengths as a weakness. He realized that one of their qualities as a, as, as a sort of operating force, the Nazis, was also a grave weakness for them. And he, with a brilliance, again, of a younger man, he realized that could be deployed against them. Uh, so he pulls off the escape. Uh, the two of them managed to escape. They lead and managed to exit um, uh, uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau on the 10th of April, 1944. And there is, and you can see dated top left, 9th of April, 1944, because at this point they were missing this is the Gestapo, um, it's a document that was received at every Gestapo station, every office across the Nazi empire, across all of occupied Europe. This, it's a kind of wanted notice. If you're able to see, I don't know how clearly you're able to read it, but five lines down, you'll see it says, one, Rosenberg, Walter, that's Walter Rosenberg, the man we're talking about. And go skip two lines down, you'll see Wetzler, Alfred. Um, you'll see they're both given the middle name Israel. That was a Nazi policy, by the way. Jews whose first names were not sufficiently Jewish were given a middle name of Israel so they could be identified as Jews. For, for women, it was the name Sarah or Sarah uh, was allocated to uh, women. That's a wanted notice saying these men must be apprehended. They have escaped from Auschwitz. Uh, incredibly, they had done that. You read that and you think, okay, well, now they're out. They're free. No, no, by no means. Once they were out of Auschwitz, they were in Nazi-occupied Poland still, as Rudy would later say, with no map, no compass, no friends. There was no network of resistance uh, comrades as there were for Polish prisoners of war or uh, Polish prisoners or Soviet prisoners of war, uh, both of whom escaped from Auschwitz in much greater numbers than Jews ever did because it was easier and also because they were under less severe guard, but also because they did have help on the outside. Fred and Rudy did not have anything of the kind. They were on their own. They then proceeded this remarkable, and I'll cut it short because of time, but this remarkable journey in which they crossed mountains and rivers and forests and 
uh, uh, marshland. They have to travel at night because they can't be seen by day. They have to just, they cannot get food. They have to forage in the forests for scraps uh, and they are uh, uh, that they can eat. They have to walk miles. Uh, and against somehow, against all the odds, they have to trust some people they meet. It's it's an amazing story how they did it. But somehow, 10 or 11 days later, they crossed the border into their home country of Slovakia. And there they make contact with the remnant Jewish community of Slovakia, uh, just a few thousand, um, some perhaps 20,000 or 25,000 Jew Jews had been left in Slovakia. They had clung on. The rest had been deported and most murdered. But there was a remnant community it, there in the basement of a Jewish old people's home in Zilina in um, uh, Slovakia. They made contact with the remnant community. And there they sat down to pour out of their heads all everything they had seen, witnessed, and absorbed. And the result was this. That is the English language translation of the document that would become known as the Verba Wetzler Report. By the way, it's because they're wanted men, you can see here under the name Rosenberg, that the people who harbour them in that basement in Zilina issue them with false papers so that Fred Wetzler becomes Josef Lanik. And Walter, Walter Rosenberg becomes Rudolf Verba. That's his code name, uh, his pseudonym, Aryan Papers. But he decides to live the rest of his life under that name. Um, there's the report, 32-page, single-space document, full of forensically detailed accounting of what had happened in and what they had witnessed in Auschwitz, the murder of hundreds of thousands of Jews uh, Rudy and Fred are able to assemble a document with, with uh, jaw-dropping detail where individual transports, dates, numbers, point of origin are listed. At that point, it is the fullest account anywhere in the world of what is happening in Auschwitz, Osvienchim, it says in brackets, the Polish name for the town, and Birkenau. Uh, this document then has to embark on a kind of escape story of its own. It is also, to my mind, an amazing story. It's never, it had never been put together in one place before, I don't think, until my book. Uh, it crosses hand to hand, smuggled. It's written, written originally in Slovak. It has to be translated. Smuggled across borders, resistance fighters, uh, uh, rebel diplomats, cl uh, um, dissident clergymen uh, and clerics in Hungary or in uh, occupied Nazi-occupied Europe, uh, take this document and pass it hand to hand. It makes its way slowly across the nations of Nazi-ruled Europe until it reaches the desks of these three people. Incredibly, this document, written by a 19-year-old and a 25-year-old, reaches the desk of Winston Churchill, who scribbles in the margin of the summary. What can be done? What can be said? It reaches Franklin Roosevelt in Washington. It reaches Pope Pius in Rome. All three of them are confronted with the evidence that Rudy had so meticulously memorized. And now, attached to the document with a paperclip on the front, is a plea from the Jewish leadership uh, in Jerusalem, Chaim Weizmann and Moshe Sharet, or Moshe Shertok as he then was, urging the Jews of Europe to, sorry, urging the Allies to save the Jews of Europe by bombing the railway tracks into Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, essentially, Rudy has set out the evidence that Auschwitz-Birkenau is a factory of death. Therefore, slow the transmission uh, mechanism, slow the conveyor belt into this factory uh, and take out the railway tracks. For different reasons, neither Churchill nor, Ro nor Roosevelt ever answer that plea. Uh, it's partly practical. Uh, Winston Churchill says, look, the Royal Air Force, we bomb at night. This is a job by day. The Americans bomb by day. He says, talk to the Americans. The Americans move this part, this proposal around. It goes from this department to that department. There's a meeting and there's another meeting. Um, and eventually Roosevelt decides that bombing the railway tracks would mean American bombs could kill Jews. And he says that would implicate us in this whole horrible business. He doesn't want to do it. And there is a plea to the Pope who is uh, handed a report 
at least say something publicly denouncing this report. He does not do that. Not at first anyway, for weeks and weeks and weeks. Now remember, the Jews of Hungary at this point are being, they're next in line and they are and will be um, uh, be put on uh, those trains to their deaths. As far as Rudy concerned, it is urgent to save their lives. And yet none of these three men acted even after or immediately after they had had the Verba Wetzler report. Um, Rudy for the rest of his life would, would be angry about that, but not nearly as angry as he was about this man. This is Reju Kastner. He was the de facto leader of Hungarian Jewry. Uh, it was a report, the, the Verbovets report was put in his hands uh, very early on, as soon as the report, the ink was barely dry on the report. I think it had been finished earlier that day when a courier takes the report to hand to him. Rudy's message had always been, warn the Jews what happens if they get on that train. Kastner was the uh, one of the leadership uh, of Hungarian Jewry. He had the report. People wanted him to warn the Jews of Hungary. It is a long story, but Reju Kastner did not pass on that report. He put that report, in effect, in a desk drawer, and the Jews of Hungary would never get the warning. As I say, it's a long story. We may talk about it in questions if you're interested. There are people who defend Kastner who says he had good reason not to pass it on because he was trying to negotiate with the Nazis himself to save Hungarian Jewish lives. Others say that he was doing that just to save a handful of lives and that the price was the Jews of Hungary. As a result, in 56 days, you know, less than two months, uh, the Jews of Hungary were deported and sent to Auschwitz and murdered at a rate of 12 to 15,000 a day. A total of 437,000 Jews were killed. And um, uh, the, uh, that colossal figure, um, as far as Rudy was concerned, was in part so large because the uh, railway tracks were not bombed and because the warning was not passed. Now, last thing to say before we go to questions is despite that, despite that, the life of Rudolf Verber is not one of failure, nor even the fate of this report. Because this report here, let's look at it again, did eventually, in late June, of 1944, it finally got into the hands of a journalist, and I'm biased, but a British journalist, uh, which, uh, you know, in a way, thank God that happened. Walter Garrett, a journalist in Zurich, got past a copy. He realized immediately how significant it was. He made sure it was translated, and he wrote a story that then got into the Swiss press, and from there into the world's press. And suddenly, the secret of Auschwitz was out. And it was known by late June. It was in the, all the world's newspapers, including the New York Times, including, you know, the Manchester Guardian, as then was in Britain. Word was out. Now, once the word was out, what's so interesting is suddenly these people take action. Winston uh, Roosevelt there, Franklin Roosevelt in the middle, sends a note to the leader, uh, the regent in Hungary, saying, we are going to win this war, and when we do, we will hold to account people who are seen to be guilty, implicated in the deportation of Hungary's Jews. The Pope there also issued, wrote to Horty, the leader of Hungar uh, Hungary's people, and said, um, uh, "You uh, need to. Uh, we, you know, we urge a, a plea for these, as he put it, unfortunate souls." He couldn't bring himself to word, use the word Jews. And so the leader of Hungary, uh, Miklos Horty, felt that he had to now save his own skin. This was self-preservation. And so he orders, at that point, the, a halt to the deportation of Hungary's Jews. It's 437,000 people who've been killed by then. But the last remaining large Jewish community that had not yet been deported was the Jews of Budapest, the capital. Some 200,000 Jews at that point. Horty is so 
spooked by this threat from Roosevelt and this plea from the Pope that he, and from the King of Sweden and others that he decides to order his men no longer to collaborate with the deportation of Jews. And sure enough, the deportations of Jews of Budapest stop to the point where a train that was on its way from Budapest to Auschwitz stops and turns back in early July of 1944. All told, some 200,000 Budapest Jews who would have been deported a matter of days later to near certain death in Auschwitz, those people were not deported at that point from Budapest. 200,000 of them. Now you think Oskar Schindler, who is famous, saved, I think, by some estimates, around uh, 1,800, I think, maybe fewer uh, Jewish lives. He is a hero for that. But this was 200,000 lives, which is why I say that Rudolf Werber is not just a towering figure of the Second World War period, but he deserves to be remembered alongside Oskar Schindler, who I just mentioned, or Anne Frank, or Primo Levi, as one of the figures from one of the figures from the Holocaust whose story uh, should define our understanding of the Shoah. He is a epic figure in Jewish history, often overlooked for reasons we might talk about, but one who deserves his recognition now. And my writing this book is part of that effort, and you listening to his story is part of that effort to rescue him from oblivion. Thank you all very much for listening to me, and I'm delighted now to talk with Jamie and to take your question. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. That was really fascinating. Uh, just one observation about Verbo. I first um, became familiar with him in the brief interviews he gave in the BBC's World at War in the 1970s, and he, he does a little clip. I, I wonder if maybe because of the way he comes off as very factual, right, and, and almost a little bit harsh, for me at least, when yeah. he speaks. And I've watched him give a couple different interviews. So, and this isn't, isn't a question or anything to address really so much as just for, maybe it's 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 that that's made his story less accessible to people than the um, other kinds of stories. Yes, very um, possibly. I mean, I've got um, all kinds of theories uh, on that about why, and I think what you've said is part of it. I think he was seen as being um, he was quite an unsentimental witness. He would talk very um, factually. He was a scientist. He would go on to become a scientist in Canada, teaching biochemistry in the University of British Columbia in Vancouver for decades. So people interpreted some of that scientific uh, detachment as being somehow unfeeling. There was more to it even than that, though, which is that there was a kind of uh, I think some people found it macabre, appreciation of the kind of black comedy of life. There is, all the way through that interview with Landsman, he, um, Verber, is smiling in a way that is very unnerving. You can see that Landsman himself is unnerved by it um, and says at one point, why is it you smile when you are describing these terrible events? And Verba says, you prefer I should cry? Um, he's, he's, he's a difficult customer. You know, he's a difficult personality to adjust to. Was that because of what he had uh, endured? Or was it because of um, uh, uh, who he was initially? But I think the other thing is that... Um, that contributed to this was that he um, would not, in any speech or uh, appearance, he would not just tell a comforting story in which Hitler and the Nazis are the baddies and everyone else is noble and good. Instead, he would point an accusing finger at even people who's regarded as heroes, like Roosevelt and Churchill, and he would not exempt from his anger, 
Jewish leaders like Kastner. He would say their failure to pass on his warning made them morally culpable. Of course, the most culpable, the people to blame are the Nazis who did the killing. But he would he would say that others had responsibility. And that would make, made him very, his message was unpalatable to a lot of people. And so the invitations dried up. He wasn't always asked to come to places. Uh, and bit by bit, his place in the narrative was began to diminish. Uh, and he was pushed to the margins of the history of this period. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. I think I'll go through them uh, maybe as they came in. Um, yes. So the first is from Arnie Goldman. And he asks, is this going to be made into a movie or a TV series? Uh, it would it, it would be phenomenal to watch. Um, have, do you have any plans for that? Have you been approached about that? There, there is, we hope, a plan. Um, with you know, there is a very uh, established writer, and there is backing and all that. But uh, for um, uh, for a what would actually be a, a television limited series, so there was some interest about making it into a film. I think the feeling was there's just too much that happens in this story. I mean, you know, you saw how long I went on here and it's very hard to jam into, I think, a film of 90 minutes. You know, we missed oh, <clears throat> we missed out a whole lot. I didn't even tell you how the escape happened. Um, imagine doing all that in one movie. So there is talk of it being a six or eight part series, you know, perhaps for one of the streaming platforms. The reason why I'm saying perhaps is my view is until, Jamie, I'm sitting at home watching the end credits on the final episode, I will never believe it. Um, because I've, you know, I think with this industry, you just don't, um, you don't bet on that. But for the moment, there is this book, and I hope for, you know, for now, people can come up, encounter the story that way. Well, you know, I certainly hope it comes true because I would like to see, especially yeah. a, a limited streaming series. I think that's the way to go. Thank um, you. Another question, and I think this maybe speaks a little bit to your sources and your process of doing research. Is uh, this is just an anonymous that came in? A remarkable story and book. How did you get so much detail about uh, Verba's life in the camps? How much was based on fact versus historical fix fiction? So there's no fiction in it. I was meticulous about that. Um, I'm so aware of people who deny the ver ver veracity and truth of the Holocaust that it was essential to me um, that we um, that every every fact in it be be documented and saw. So I didn't allow myself to make up anything. It meant the process of writing was very slow because I would write three or four words and then I would stop and think, is he now turning left or is he turning right? I need to get the diagram out. I need to look, how does block 16 relate to block 12? You know, um, I was very lucky in many respects. One of them is that Rudy himself left behind a very good memoir um, written, published in 1963, so 60 years ago now, um, that was very particularly good on his period in Auschwitz. Uh, he also gave these very long and extensive interviews. Um, I mentioned, you know, at the top, the one with Claude Landsman. There is a transcript of that lodged with of the whole interview, not just what's in the film. He interviewed him for four or five hours. It's, it's, it's you know, well over 100 pages. Uh, it's in the, um, uh, it's, it's deposited in the archive of the Holocaust Museum and the, um, and there were other interviews he gave, the makers of the World at War documentary series. Again, there's a transcript. He gave lectures and talks, again, documented. Um, so he left behind a huge amount of written material. I should mention how lucky I was that uh, in the process of writing, I tracked down Rudy's first wife, who was then living in London, um, uh, Goethe Verbova. Uh, you know, she was 93. I managed to find her. We sat in her garden during the summer of 2020, uh, socially distanced because you couldn't, I couldn't risk uh, giving COVID to a 93-year-old. What was amazing about her was that she had known Rudy before Auschwitz when they were teenagers in, in their hometown of Ternova. Rudy was 14. She was 12. She had had a sort of, you know, she was a childhood sweetheart. They had married after the war. It had not been a good marriage. It had ended very acrimoniously. But on the last of my five or six visits, uh, she was a frail lady by then. She said to me, look, my grandson is, is here. I've asked my grandson to come because there's something I want to give you. And it's upstairs. It's too heavy for me to get it. And her 25-year-old grandson went upstairs and he came down with a red suitcase. And the two of them kind of ceremonially handed it to me. 
and said, those are Rudy's letters. And inside was this cap of handwritten letters that Rudy had written actually mainly to his daughters, but also to his ex-wife in English because they had grown up in England. And those were hugely valuable. And the last thing to say is about Rudy's second wife, who is still alive, his widow, uh, Robin Verber, um, who it was a hugely generous source and was able to direct me to other papers of his. They're now kept, his Rudy's papers are kept in the Roosevelt Presidential Library. Uh, and I was able to go through those. So there was a huge volume of material that he left behind one way and another. And then, of course, I was able to interview a whole lot of other people who had worked with him or knew him or who had expertise on Auschwitz. But no, in answer to your very serious point, uh, I was insistent that no, not a single word in this book would be Im imagined. It had to be documented. It had to be written. And there is enough survivor testimony. You really can reconstruct in great detail what happened in Auschwitz-Birkenau. Excellent. Thanks. Yeah, those kind of stories are so difficult to piece together from all these different kind of sources. And I think in many ways it is sometimes tempting to try to put our own interpretation on things that they say or places they haven't, things they haven't talked about and you want them to talk about. And sometimes it's, and, and certainly with anything Holocaust related, that's very dangerous, right? So I, I, you know, I look through your sources and everything. It's really remarkably sourced book and well researched. Speaking of, did Rudolph, did the escape artist testify at the Nuremberg trials? This is another question that came in through the. YouTube. It's a very good question. He gave a deposition uh, from London. He offered to come. I think he gave it instead uh, from. Um, uh, a, you know, via a diplomatic mission, an Israeli diplomatic mission. Um, and it's there in the archive. The the Verba Wetzler report itself um, is uh, deposit was deposited as part of the... Uh, sorry, did you ask at Nuremberg or Eichmann trial? I'm sorry, Nuremberg. Did he sorry, or forgive at me. Eichmann? Forgive me, forgive me, because I'm no, bundling, okay. I'm, I'm mixing the two, so that's important. Um, he offered to testify, testify for the Eichmann trial, and his offer was not taken up. Some historians speculate that was because he would have started accusing Kastner, and Kastner at that point was a really sore point. Kastner went to live in Israel after the war, and there were some, you know, people were divided on Kastner. Some people believed he was a hero. Some be people believed he was a real villain of the period. Uh, Kastner was, I tell the story in my book, he was eventually gunned down. He was assassinated in Israel. It's a huge story. Um, the Verba Wetzler report was absolutely entered into evidence for the Eichmann trial. And I think, although now that you raise it, I want to check if it also was for Nuremberg. And I think it was. Um, but that report was seen as hugely essential document. And for many years, it was still, it was the sort of go-to account for what had happened in Auschwitz. It was only in many years later that you know fuller accounts as in whole books would 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 supplant it and because it was seen as the core sort of foundational text for our knowledge of what happened there yeah interesting thank you and speaking of Kastner do uh so he was assassinated in Israel I'm assuming because of what happened but do you have any more detail on why he was assassinated who assassinated him yeah it's 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 debated to this day so um the theory uh, the, you know, there's speculation, like you can imagine those sort of conspiracy theories. Officially, the verdict was that it was uh, dis descendants of Hungarian Jews um, who were angry that this man, because Kastner was, would then be the subject of a huge trial in Israel. <clears throat> the uh, a survivor, a Hungarian Jew, whose whole family had lost 50 plus members of his family, um, Issue wrote a kind of pamphlet, a Jacuz pamphlet, denouncing Kastner, saying he blamed Kastner for the death of his family. Uh, Kastner sued for libel. It went to a trial. Um, the judge found against Kastner. And the judge in the trial said Kastner had um, signed, sold his soul to the devil, that he had done a pact with the devil in, in sitting down with Eichmann. Um, Eichmann then appealed the verdict and it was going to the Supreme Court when he was assassinated. Official version is other angry Hungarian Jews gunned him down. There is speculation that actually maybe it was sort of, this is a conspiracy theory, I've not seen evidence of it, but I didn't look, look into this too deeply because it was beyond the scope of my story. 
but the you know there are theories that was Cath were, um, were the assassins actually working for you know the Israeli authorities of the day who felt that Kastner's story was too embarrassing because Kastner was aligned with the governing party of Israel, the Israeli Labour Party at the time. Um, I'll just say this, that this, this issue is not just historic. It remains contested in Israel now. For this reason, if nothing else, Kastner's granddaughter is today the leader of the Israeli Labour Party. Um, Merav Michaeli is the granddaughter of Reju Kastner. So there are still defenders and there are still opponents, and it is a very, very enjoined issue uh, in Israel itself to this day. Um, the whole books have been written on it. He's, you know, Kastner played an important um, Kastner played an important part in the life of Rudolf Verba, um, which is uh, why I talk about him in the book. But he's not the whole story, and um, you know, there, there for a long time, I think the controversy over Kastner got in the way of people engaging with the amazing story of Verba. But Verba's own story stands, whatever view you take of Kastner, whether you think he's a hero or villain, what um, Verba did is an extraordinary act. It's interesting. And I think a lot of people who aren't either well, Jewish or that uh, really look at Israeli society, Israeli politics, how the Holocaust still has such a uh, historical resonance with, with Israeli society in that, you know, it has in and of itself has, you know, Kind of driven rifts and yeah. separations into Israeli society, Kastner and, and the Eichmann trial, right, and Hannah Arendt and everything. Absolutely. So it's very interesting. Um, yeah, can I can I pick up on that just because there's one point I did sure. mention before, and I, I feel like it was a big part of why I felt the book was relevant now because you just said about how the Holocaust is still so resonant for Israeli society, and I completely agree. Uh, but it also the the there's a theme here that is is a for me a universal human thing. Uh, which I just want to mention because I, I I hadn't got to it. Among the different responses to this report, the one that Rudolf Verber in a way did not bargain for was the one that interested me most, which was incredulity, disbelief. People could not believe what was put in front of them. And I tell a story in the book, which I think is amazing, which is not about uh, Verber and Wetzler, but about an earlier whistleblower, if you like, a man called Jan Karski, who never knew anything about Auschwitz, I should stress. Nobody uh, knew about Auschwitz uh, as early as when Karski knew, though, about the killing of Jews. And he, in 1942 uh, and 43, he knew that there was a program of mass extermination. He made his way to London. He met Anthony Eden, Churchill's uh, foreign secretary. He went to Washington and met Roosevelt uh, to present the evidence. And he had a meeting with a Felix Frankfurt, a Jewish judge on the United States Supreme Court, and he told him what he had seen. And Frankfurt, at the end of his presentation, said to Karski, um, I don't believe you. Um, and the man who brought Karski there, the diplomat, said, no, no, you must believe him. This man comes with the highest possible endorsement. And Frankfurt said, I did not say he was not telling the truth. I said, I cannot believe him. These are different things. I cannot believe him. It was impossible to believe the horror that was being described, in that case by Karski, but Verba and Wetzel encountered something similar. The handful of people who did see in Hungary the verba Wetzler report, it's not like they all then made arrangements to escape. A lot of them refused to believe it. It was in black and white in front of them. Not everyone, saw, you know, very, very few people saw it. But the people who did see it, a lot of them could not digest, particularly older people, interestingly. Younger people heard the warning. They were tr immediately trying to get out. But people who had a job or a property or family, who had something to lose, something shut down, they could not believe it. And just after I'd finished writing the book, in February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. And there were stories on the radio of fat r people in Ukraine on, on the news and TV, people in Ukraine phoning their family in Moscow to say, we are under bombardment. There are Russian bombs landing on us right now. And their own mother or brother or sister in Moscow would say, I don't believe you. And this is a to me, this is one of the big things I took from the book. You know, we live now in the era of post-truth 
and all the kind of conspiracy theories and the lies that are around on the internet, this is something extra that human beings really do struggle to absorb truth that is painful to hear. And that's one of the big long legacies or long resonances of Rudolf Werber's story. And I think now when I look back on why it was I picked up this story that I'd first seen when I was 19, why did I go back to it? I think this is the reason why. He, he remember Rudy, age 19, a boy, a teenager, risked everything to get the truth out from underneath this mountain of lies. And that is a message for our own time. Yeah, absolutely. And that may be uh, one of the more uni universalizing messages that we can take from the Holocaust. Because as a Holocaust educator, it's very difficult, right, to, to, to get something out of this when you're teaching the course, right? Yeah. So time for a couple more questions. Uh, yes. So, and these are both about um, Vexler. Okay, so Mark Udlev asks, um, or says basically, you know, Rudy falls out with Vexler. Why? Why did they have a falling out? And then I'll, I'll just dovetail that with the question from Gail. Um, asks, what happened to Vexler then after the war? Yes, no, good questions. And Fred Vetzler really does deserve his story to be told. It was um, So it was much harder for me to get at. He never left Slovakia. He was behind the Iron Curtain. He died uh, before, uh, you know, the end of communist rule in Czechoslovakia. Um, that is very relevant because it meant, because of the way you'll know this, Jamie, from your professional work, but, you know, in the Soviet bloc, they really did not tell the truth about the Holocaust. Uh, they said it was, you know, anti-fascists were persecuted. They didn't say it was Jews. And therefore, Fred Wetzler was never really able to tell his story directly. He wrote instead a novel in which he changed the names. It was very difficult for me to use that uh, or rely on that too much as a source for the reasons we were talking about before, which is I wanted this to be wholly a work of nonfiction. But the reasons were they, 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 so that's one reason why Fred Wetzler is less famous, actually, not that Rudolf Erb is very famous, but the, the two reasons they fell out. One was about credit. Um, the, uh, the, the, neither of them got much credit, but there was some resentment felt by Wetzler, I think, and particularly friends of Wetzler, who felt that Rudy was going on films like Claude Landsman's film and others and sort of taking the limelight. My view is actually, if you look at the interviews Wetzler, uh, that Rudy gave, he was always assiduous. He was extremely careful always to say, Fred Wetzler and I, we did this. Didn't say I did this. But nevertheless, maybe in the clips that got used or whatever, people thought he was trying to make it about him. So there was an argument there about credit. And really, it comes down to the fact that Rudy was in the West. It was one of his great escapes. He escaped the Cold War communist Czechoslovakia for the West. And in the West, he could tell his story freely and be in movies and he spoke English. He was always going to get more attention. But the second thing, which I think is perhaps surprising and fascinating, Fred married a Holocaust survivor. Fred, Va Fred Wetzler married an Auschwitz survivor. Now, you would think that would bond these three people, Fred, Rudy, and, and Fred's wife, uh, Etta. It didn't. Rudy was suspicious of survivors of Auschwitz. Now, that is a hard thing to say. But Rudy wondered, because he knew what that place was like, and he thought, what did you do in order to survive? And that is a, that's a, a very taboo thing to talk about. And this is what, what I mean about why he's a difficult character, Rudolf Erber, because he would think, unless you, you, know, you prove to him that you weren't some kind of you know, collaborator or so on, he capo would capo, yes. I mean, I was almost holding back from the word because it's such an ugly word, but yes, capos who were henchmen of the Nazis, you know, often prisoners, very often not Jewish actually, but there were some Jews. He would be suspicious. And several people I spoke to said he had a he was suspicious of uh Fred Wetzler's wife, that that was a tension there between. The three of them. Uh, the, on the other hand, Ro, you know, Robin Verber, R Rudy's widow, did tell me that uh, uh, um, Rudy continued to send even financial support to Fred because it was hard being in, you know, post uh, uh, communist era uh, Bratislava. Uh, but it was not an easy 
uh, you know, ending of this story. You want it, I wanted it in a way to be like a buddy movie. These two guys had done the most extreme, extraordinary thing and that they would be friends forever. It didn't really work out like that. Um, that last story I've told you about him being suspicious of the of his friend's wife goes to something amazing. I found a letter in which a BBC documentary maker invites Rudy to take part in a documentary. And Rudy writes to him and says, I must warn you, I am not your cliched Holocaust survivor. Yeah. I mean, what an amazing phrase to use, right? Yeah. Um, to, to talk as if there are such things as cliched Holocaust survivors. But you know what he means. What he was trying to say was, I'm not going to give you a story in which everything then was terrible, but everything now is great. And I've looked into the abyss, but I've come out and I'm now can tell you that human beings are basically good and that I can give you a feel good story. And what he detected, something which I think is true, which is we often look to Holocaust survivors to comfort us, to give us consoling wisdom. And Rudy Verber was not in that business. Okay, thank you both, Jonathan and Jamie, for being uh, with us for such a fascinating discussion and for making the Holocaust relevant. And thanks to all of you for joining us virtually. Remember to like this video, subscribe to our U YouTube channel, and visit our website, jccdet.org slash book fair for our full schedule and ways to get involved. Hope to see you at our next event.